Good morning. Welcome to the Flora Methodist Church. We're so happy you're here on the 10th of July. Yes, brothers and sisters, can you believe what a crazy 4th of July week we had this, this week? I hope you watched the video from last Sunday. If you didn't, you can go back. It's recorded uh, forever, and so you can pick it up off YouTube or Facebook. It was tremendous. There's no sermon there, just great singing and uh, a lot of testimonies about our great country, and uh, you'll hear from uh, a lot of points of view, and it'll be well worth it. So go back. If you missed last week's service from July the 3rd, go back and watch it. You will be so blessed. Friends, I'm glad you're watching today. In uh, a couple of weeks, we're going to have... Uh, uh, Rick Wright will be here Sunday night, and I'm thinking that's the 17th. Can somebody verify that? We're going to say the 17th, and uh, we'll have them. Let's go for 6 o'clock. We'll have it at 6 o'clock. We're going to do some praise and worship, and we're going to let Rick speak. He's down here on the coast, uh, on the coast of Mississippi, doing a camp meeting at, at Palmer's Creek. I think that's in Harrison County, and then he'll be on his way home, he lives just north of Nashville, so he'll stop in, be with us for one service only. So join us, invite somebody to come, and we're going to pray that night for a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Friends, we are so glad you're watching today. I wish you were here in our sanctuary. We've changed venues here. I'm standing behind the pulpit, which is something I don't even do on Sundays. Uh, in our live church, but uh, but we're shooting here. We have a great song for you. The praise man's going to lead us in a song this morning, and they'll be uh, singing the night that Rick comes. That's July the 17th, and so we are very excited about that. But right now, let's uh, let's uh, let's go into our worship. Praise band, take it away. I can't find the words and I can barely breathe I'm falling on my knees heaven help me heaven help me when I can't feel you near when I can't hear you speak I'm falling on my knees heaven help me heaven help me Help me, help me, cause I can't walk this road alone, and I can't do this on my own. Tell me, tell me, and I just need to hear you say that everything will be okay. I don't understand I don't think I can I know you have a plan for so heaven help me heaven help me help me help me cause I can't walk this road alone and I can't do this on my own just need to hear you say that everything will be okay. Help me believe it, and I can see it. Help me to know it, and I can't hold to know it when I can't hold on help me help me cause I can't walk this road alone and I can't do this on my own tell me 
hearts need to hear you say and everything will be okay i just need to hear you say that everything will be okay when i can't find the words when i can barely breathe i'm falling on my knees heaven help me heaven help me Okay, friends, I misspoke. I said a couple weeks. It's actually next Sunday night, the 17th. And so we are excited about that. Friends, if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at a very famous passage. And I'm only going to read the first 10 verses. I would like to read the entire chapter because Jesus brings it home in John chapter 10. It is amazing. Jesus is headed to the cross he raises Lazarus from the dead in chapter 11 of John and then two weeks later so this is toward the end of Jesus life and it's a very famous passage and we're just going to look at the first 10 verses I may throw in a couple extra for you but if you have your Bibles join me in John chapter 10 beginning with verse 1 all of this written in red, of course. I tell you the truth, or verily, verily, or truly, truly, whatever version of the Bible you have, it's, it's Jesus' way of saying you need to underscore this. This is important. Maybe you're going to forget something I said in the Sermon on the Mount, or maybe you're going to forget something I said when I was in Chorazim, or when I was in Nazareth, or when I was somewhere else. But you do not need to forget this. This is so important. Jesus is saying, underline this. I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The watchmen who are hirelings open the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run from a stranger because they do not recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, verse 6, but they did not understand what he was telling him, so Jesus repeated himself. Look at verse 7. I tell you the truth. Underline this. Let me help you understand this metaphor. I am the gate for the sheep, and all who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly, or life to the fullest. And then in verse 11 through the end of this, chapter Jesus reiterates time and again this phrase I am the good shepherd how do we know that the 23rd psalm refers to Jesus because Jesus says so I am the good shepherd he uses that refrain over and over you'll see it once and you'll see it twice and you'll see it three times and you'll see it four times you'll see this repeated through this passage as Jesus makes this central point over and over and over again and of course the Jews in this the Jewish leaders not the Jewish people Jesus was Jewish his disciples were Jewish but the Jewish leaders accuse him of blasphemy Jesus they said we're going to stone you and Jesus said what law did I break this is all in this chapter in chapter 10 and they said well we're not going to stone you for breaking laws we're going to stone you for blasphemy and Jesus winds up in, a, in a, a very heated debate with the with the Pharisees then Jesus makes this point he said you know 
He said, a good, the, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He said, I have come, and you think you're going to take my life? You're not going to take my life. I'm going to give my life. Jesus says that in this chapter. He said, you can't take, you don't have the power to take my life. I'm going to lay my life down. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so this is really just an amazing, and we can dig through this chapter if we want to, but I'm going to focus on one little part of this where I think that maybe we just kind of blow past this. And that is where it says, uh, my sheep know my voice. We're the, we are, we are the sheep of his, he's the good shepherd, we're the sheep of his pasture he tells us we're the sheep that God has given him and and no no man can pluck us out of his hands he says and so it really is a, a remarkable passage but this morning we're going to talk about the voice of the Lord the voice of God hearing God speak we are uh, we are moving uh, at uh, the speed of thought into the into the end times, and we're in the middle of it. And and how much time we have left, nobody knows. And and I've been hinting around at this for the last several weeks, or you go back a few months and you hear me talking about this. And and I'm going to preach. I think just a couple Sundays ago, I used Revelation chapter 19. You remember? But this is this is I think. The key to thriving, surviving, and thriving in the last days is being able to hear the voice of God. And that's, it's kind of a shame, really, that, that, that preachers actually preach against hearing God's voice. They say things like, well, now that we have the Bible, we don't need to hear God's voice. Friends, we wouldn't even know we could hear God's voice if it weren't for the Bible. It's the Bible that tells us we need to hear God's voice. God's voice is, is uh, so important. Uh, you remember uh, Hannah, she was barren, and Panana, the her husband's other wife, was having these children, and she was being mocked, and she just wept, and, and she prayed. Maybe in the Holy Ghost, she was praying so hard they couldn't understand what she was saying. And they said, oh, Lord, she's drunk. She wasn't drunk. She was just weeping bitterly before the Lord. She poured out her heart and she told God, if you give me a son, I'll let him grow up. I'll, I'll sanctify him and he'll grow up in, in the house of the Lord. And as soon as he's weaned. And so God gave her Samuel, Samuel, and uh and he went to live in a temple. He lived there with Eli. And one, one night when Samuel was small, he heard somebody say, Samuel, because God knows our names. Even, even Paul, before he was Paul, he was Saul. Do you remember on the road to Damascus? Saul, Saul, why do you persecute thou me? You know, he knew Saul's name. And so... Samuel woke up and he ran in there and he, he, he saw Eli. He said, he said uh, did you, did, Eli, did you call me? And he said, no, you you're, must have been dreaming. Go back to bed. And so he went back to, he went back to bed. Samuel lays down and goes back to, to sleep and he hears the voice again. Samuel? And he jumps up, he runs into Eli and he said, hey, hey, I, you call me? And Eli said, no, it wasn't me. You're hearing things. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed and a third time, the voice of the Lord comes to Samuel and says, Samuel. And so he jumps up, he runs back in there to Eli, and Eli says, uh, here's what's happening, Samuel. God's talking to you. So next time you hear your name, God call your name, say, say uh, it's me, Lord. Your servant is listening. And so Samuel became the most prolific prophet, I think, of the entire uh uh, of the entire Old Testament. He is the only prophet, and he's, you know, he's not a prophet with these humongous prophecies like, uh, like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, but it's only said of Samuel that 
that everything he said, everything he prophesied came to pass. And, and nobody else can say that. Only Samuel, he was, he was perfect in his prophecies. I don't know a prophet anywhere that doesn't miss it from time to time and doesn't misunderstand from time to time. There are false prophets that prophesied accurately, but they preached a false God. And that's really what makes a false prophet. It's not getting it wrong every now and then. And then there was Elijah, who after his showdown on Mount Carmel, Elijah runs as fast as he can, and he runs across the desert. And if you've ever been to Mount Carmel, you go all the way into Egypt. My goodness, that's an impossible journey. Really, it's just arduous to do it on a bus. You can imagine running, and the angel came in to help him one day. He, he was so afraid, and, and he ran, and he was so afraid of Jezebel. After he had whooped <laughs> openly all of those false prophets, you know, he, he made his way into a cave near Mount Sinai. And you'll see the cave if you ever go to Egypt to Mount Sinai. You see the cave, and you can walk over there and go in it. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a pretty healthy walk off the trail, but there's a tree planted right in front of it, so you won't miss it. But he was in there, and he was trembling. He was so afraid, feeling sorry for himself, and, and bragging to God about how faithful he was after he had run for his life. <laughs> I'm the only person in all of Israel who is saved. You know, he sounded like Brother Swaggart or somebody. I'm the only person who is saved. I'm the only person who hasn't bowed a knee to the false gods and so God wanted to speak to him, and so there was, there was a rushing mighty wind that blew through there, and the wind was so strong that it, it broke rocks. That's strong wind. He said, God, are you in the wind? But he wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake, and he said, God, you must be speaking. There was an earthquake, but he wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, and I don't know what burned, because there's other than that tree right in front of his right in front of his cave. I, you, you can go a long way without seeing any vegetation there. But he, he said, God, are you in the fire? And God wasn't in the fire. He wasn't in the wind or the earthquake. And then he heard a still, small voice. He, he heard the voice of God. And so God corrects him, sends him back to finish his job, to choose a successor for him, Elisha, and then it was just quite a remarkable thing. He said, oh, kind of a parting shot, God says this to Elijah. He says, by the way, you're not the only one. <laughs> There's 7,000 in Israel that never bowed their knee to Baal or to Jezebel or to any of those false prophets. So that was quite a, that was quite a story, wasn't it? In the book of Revelation, the, the chapter 2 and chapter 3, it gives us a little biographical sketch of the seven churches in Turkey called Asia Minor back then, but seven churches in Turkey that, uh, that the book of Revelation was written to. And uh, one of them was a really good church, and one of them was a really bad church, and the other five were somewhere in the middle. But he says the same thing to all seven of them at the end of these little biographical sketches and in some ways, to some churches, rebukes. He says, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches. And so we, we know that really from Genesis to Revelation, from the Garden of Eden all the way to the New Jerusalem, uh, God wants a relationship with his people and God speaks to his people and God wants us to hear his voice. I like the hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. In that uh, opening verse it says, Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Uh, that's, very, that's very powerful. And... Uh, I would, I would adopt this to my sermon just a little bit where I believe going into the last days and living abundantly, living victoriously, living life to its fullness in the last days is going to require us to tune our hearing to hear his voice. If you grew up 
uh, my first radio as a, as a small child in the 60s uh, was a transistor radio. It had got AM only. And so late at night, you could hear radio stations from everywhere, but you just had to tune it just right to get on that frequency. Well, God has a frequency. He has a, uh, he has a, a way of speaking that's just him. You know, there are a thousand voices that are played. Every voice that we've ever heard has the potentiality of replaying in our memory or in our minds over and over and over again. Negative things that we heard as, as children can haunt us as adults because it just plays over and over and over. So we have to tune our ears to hear his grace before he tunes our heart to sing his grace. And I believe what God is doing in this hour in which we're living is he's tuning our ears. And it's causing an awakening among our people. Uh, there's there's a, an awakening politically, and there is going to be, or we're in the middle of, an awakening spiritually. Uh, and I think uh, the spiritual comes first and then the, then the political. The first great awakening led to the war of independence the second great of awake second great awakening culminated in the uh, freeing of the slaves in the in the civil war radical social change the third great awakening is is culminating or cresting with the end of uh, abortion on demand and uh and the second coming of Jesus Christ. I believe his coming is just that soon. So what I want to encourage you today is to is to ask the Lord. I'm going to pray for you in just a few minutes. This is a short sermon. I'm going to pray for you in just a few moments for you to hear God's voice. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. If you if you cannot hear God speak, then I worry about you. When I, when I see ministers, I know I think I've been unfriended about, by most of my Methodist pastor friends on Facebook, and, and, and that's, that's fine. I just really got under one skin recently <laughs> because what he was putting out on his Facebook page is none of my business. I should have unfriended. Listen, it's none of my business what he put out, but he put out some things that set my teeth on edge. He was misquoting Jesus to promote his political ideology. And I just called him out and said, you cannot do that. You cannot weaponize the words of Jesus to promote your political ideology and to attack that football coach who won at the Supreme Court, who wanted to pray, wanted to pray by himself. You know, friends, uh, it's a horrible thing when we have bishops and pastors and theologians and seminary professors who, who, who can't hear God's voice, who, who don't know the difference between a, the voice of the enemy and the voice of the Lord. Goodness. I, uh, I'm going to tell you uh, a series of events that happened to me in 1980. Six, and uh, I was brand new in a church, and I was had a lovely parsonage, about five years old, a small brick, four bedroom, two bathroom house, and it was just a nice place to live. And I had a very forgiving congregation. In fact, I had two of them, very forgiving people. And and I think that uh, they knew that I was an idiot. <laughs> And I think that they just had grace. And but the Lord was instructed me and I spent a lot of time in the word and a lot of time just sort of sweating out things. And and uh, and really. I didn't recognize this in real time, but what I'm what I'm about to tell you is the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I've never used this in a sermon. I've never used it in a teaching. And so even though I'm going back 36 years, uh, 
this is pivotal. This happened 36 years ago, but this is pivotal to uh, where, where I am now and where we are as a nation. Can you, can you believe that? It just, uh, just praying over this and thinking about it and studying on this and digging into the word like I've done this week, this, this, this has come to my mind so frequently in the last several weeks that I just, it just caused me to dive into the word. And, and I believe the Lord was tuning my hearing to, to hear his voice. I, I, will t- I will tell you this, I've had discernment for a long time. Before I was ever in the ministry, I can, I can discern things, discerning of spirits, and I can see, I can see things that uh, maybe others can't see, and, and, and it's kind of a, it's kind of a, it's a gift and a curse at the same time. Let me, before I tell you this story, and I'm, I know I'm going to blow your mind, and some people just aren't going to believe me, they're going to think I'm lying about the whole thing, I am not lying. A, a prophet, I don't, I don't claim to be a prophet, but a prophet is famous on earth for what they say. But a prophet is famous in heaven for what they don't say. A, promise, a prophet is famous on earth for what he knows and what he says. But he's famous in heaven for what he knows and he doesn't say. So the Lord will speak to you and give you information, a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, a prophetic word that he wants you to pray about. He wants you to intercede about. He wants you to to, uh, stand before him and provide a prayer cover, maybe for a situation in a family or in a church or or in a city or, or even nationally or internationally that... Uh, that you don't need to tell. It's private things. The secret things belong to the Lord, Deuteronomy says. And, and the Lord shares you a secret. He, he doesn't necessarily want you to go and stand on a platform before a bunch of people and tell everything you know. Some things he just gives you a heads up on, and you've got to learn to keep it. And, and I've had to learn that, and sometimes I learn that the hard way. But... Uh, but Looking back, looking through the rearview mirror, I can see where God showed me things along the way, and they are just uh, uh, you know, nothing Isaiah, nothing Ezekiel, nothing Daniel. Uh, that's the Lord telling me to hurry up. Uh, you know, nothing like that. Just just things so I would get used to being able to hear his voice because he had bigger things coming down the line. And so this is the story. Th- three separate events. I was, uh, had a recliner in the parsonage where I lived. I moved in when I was 24 years old. I'm probably 25 time goes I moved in in 86 and this is sometime in that in that year and I'm sitting in a recliner and I'm rocking back and forth and we got this little 13 inch television and and it's sitting over here so I sat in a recliner I looked over there and and I kept had it had I had this sensation uh you need to pull this recliner back and look at the back of it and so I just kind of sat there. I was watching whatever I was watching in 1986. And, but I got this really strong sensation, and I could just, I could hear what I've learned was the voice of God. I didn't recognize it. I didn't have a framework for this. I, I knew about speaking in tongues. I knew about casting out devils. I knew about anointing with oil. But I didn't really know anything about God's voice or flowing in any kind of gift or word of knowledge or word of wisdom or prophecy, discernment. I didn't know about any of that. And so I got up and I pulled the recliner over and looked up the back. And walking up the back of that recliner was a black widow spider. And I went, my goodness, I knocked it down and then I killed it. 
And, and then I sort of sat back down and I thought, why in the world? I mean, what made me jump up and pull that, that recliner down? But I did, and there was that spider. One night I was uh, after that, sometime after that, I was in I was in bed and and getting ready to go to sleep and and then uh, I had a uh, blue and white seersucker shirt and you know like a seersucker suit. I had two seersucker suits back in those days. I looked like Matlock and uh, I had this little seersucker. Sure, and I got it because it doesn't really ever need to be ironed because the thing is always wrinkled. And uh, it was hanging in my closet with my other stuff, and, and a voice came to me, not, not audibly, but just sort of in my mind. It said, go look at that seersucker shirt. And so I got out of bed and I walked over there, and I opened up the closet, and I had a little bitty not a walk-in closet, but just a, you know, the closets. And, and I, I took the shirt out, I, the, that shirt, the, the one I heard look, I took it out and I opened up, unbuttoned the button that it was, so I unbuttoned it and hang it hanging there. And I looked on in the collar of that shirt and there in the collar of that shirt was a black widow spider. <laughs> Dang, and now I'm, now I'm freaking out. And I don't know how to interpret this. And I and so, wow, pow, throw it on the ground and step on it and burn that shirt. <laughs> oh, that little fella, that little woman laying eggs. And so that's playing in my mind. I don't tell anybody in the church that. And, and I think I told it Sue Ellen, and you know, she's sort of new to all this. And, we're young, we have a little, Mallory is about, she was 10 months old when we started. And, uh, and one day I'm sitting around the house at the, at the parsonage and walked out into the yard and I heard the voice of the Lord. Now that's what I'm calling it now. That's not what I called it then. I just had, you know, women's intuition. <laughs> man's intuition and I heard the voice of the Lord say go around the back of your house and kill that black widow spider and so I went what is it with me and black widow spiders and I said where is it Lord and the Lord said it's in that old barbecue grill there's a barbecue grill that sat out by the back porch not not a porch but the, by the back door and it had been there I guess since Moses what had pastored there it was just an old rusty thing and I just guess I never threw it away so I walked over to it and I lifted up the lid you know the kind you would buy at a, at a drug store just a little bitty you know put the little briquettes in it and, and I opened it up and there sitting there looking at me was a black widow spider and I killed it and uh, and so I didn't have a framework for those for those events, and I wasn't sure what was happening, but I kept those things, and I just hit them in my heart. And over the course of time and over the course of years, because of those three events with those three black widow spiders all within months, within weeks of each other, I learned over time that that was the voice of the Lord, and I learned to hear God's voice, and I learned to trust God's voice. And when, when uh, things are going well in my life and I ha I'm walking in victory, I, I've noticed it's because I'm hearing God's voice very well. And when things are not going well in my life, when there's sorrow or where there's death or where there's unanswered prayer, when I find myself crying or weeping over a situation in my life where when I can barely function, when my pain is so deep and my, and, uh, my, my scars are so raw, uh, I'm not hearing God's voice very well. Let me tell you what St. Paul said about that, 
from John chapter 10, go to Romans chapter 10, and you, and you hear this, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And, and in that verse, he doesn't use the word logos, which is the, the word we use for word. The Greek word that means word, W-O-R-D, logos. He uses the word rhema, R-H-E-M-A. And we're not even sure exactly in our lexicons what that exactly means, but it, it's written like this. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing God speak. Not just what God said, but what God is saying. And uh, so there's nowhere in the Bible that says there is a spider crawling up the back of your recliner. There's a spider in that old barbecue grill. There's black widow spiders, all three. There's a black widow. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, look unto thou shirt hanging in thou closet, and thou will findeth a black widow spider. It doesn't say that in the Bible. But, but faith comes not when we... <clears throat> hear what God said, but when we hear what God is saying. And God is speaking loudly now to his church uh, from his word, obviously, but not just from his word, but by his spirit. Whoever has ears to hear, he said this seven times to all seven churches, the great church the horrible church and the five other churches in between of those seven churches, all seven churches. Seven's a number of, of, of God. It's a number of perfection. So God is saying this to, to, every, to every church of all time. Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit of God is saying Friends, can I tell you that God is speaking loudly? He's speaking loudly. And people are beginning to hear. And people are beginning to wake up. There's a, there's a movement. There's a movement afoot. The Spirit is ablaze. God is moving among us, in us, through us. We need to hear his voice. I'm not at all judging you, but I would ask you this morning, if you've been a Christian for five years, for 25 years, for 50 years, and you've never heard the voice of the Good Shepherd. If I were you, I would do some soul searching. I would find out why God's sheep know his voice. The good shepherd sheep know the good shepherd's voice. Let me pray for you right now. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for passages like John chapter 10. And we just read 10 verses, but the entire chapter is so good. And Lord, we want to be, we want to be a good sheep for the good shepherd that would hear your voice and follow you. Lord God, I pray right now in Jesus' name, Lord, that you would touch everybody. Touch everybody, Lord, and let, let us hear more clearly, God, your voice. There's a thousand, maybe maybe 10,000 voices in our world, Lord. Lord, you know that, it, that the noise of this world fills our minds. And, 
It comes to us from CNN. It comes to us from MTV. It comes to us from Fox News. It, it comes to us through all of these mediums. And it just, it just clogs our hearing, God. But Lord, we're your people. And we want to hear your voice. Lord, help us to tune out everything that's not you, Lord. Even, even the religious, even the pastors, especially the pastors, the theologians, the bishops, the religious class. They hated you then and they still do. Lord, help us to tune our hearts to sing your grace, to tune our ears to hear your voice. Jesus, it's so important in the hour in which we live that we hear your voice. So, Lord, speak to us. Lord, your servants are listening. Speak to us, Lord. Your sheep are listening for your voice. Speak to us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Friends, thank you for tuning in today. Let me give you one word of encouragement. You know, if, if, if you're speaking to somebody and they're hard of hearing, maybe you have a friend or relative that's, uh, that's deaf and they have a hard time hearing, it's incumbent upon the speaker to make sure the hearer can hear to maybe get their attention and so they can help them to hear, to maybe read their lips or, to, or if they're deaf in one ear, they turn their heads and listen with the other ear. I'll say this to you. The Lord knows your heart of hearing. He knows one thing is your heart of hearing since the fall, spiritually hard of hearing. And the other thing is, is he knows that you're distracted. <laughs> that you're not really listening. But it's not incumbent upon you, it's incumbent upon him to speak and to be heard. And so the Lord will do whatever he needs to do to speak to you and get your attention. Maybe you're going through something in this life that's really rough. Let me ask you something, friends. Does the Lord have your attention? He has mine. Listen to his voice. He's speaking to you. Words of hope, words of life, words of grace. Mm -hmm.